Today, we're going to look at some <clears throat> side topics that come from that series. And uh, one of the side topics that can come from the topic of visions and prayers, we know that prayer is energizing. And uh, so today, I'm talking about spiritual energies that flow when we pray. And it might explain a lot of things in the Bible which we cannot explain with natural sciences. So let me point to some of the events. <clears throat> And um, let's uh, look in the Bible at Genesis chapter 22. <clears throat> the event of uh, Abraham sacrificing his son Isaac. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We ask that you continue to establish each one of us in you. We ask, O oh God, that you continue to open the eyes of our understanding and you will reveal, Father God, all the goodness of your grace and your mercy. You continue to open the eyes of our understanding through the spirit of wisdom and revelation. For we recognize, Father, that unless you reveal, we cannot understand. Unless your spirit unfold, it remains hidden. And Father, in the fullness of time, you have always revealed different things. As he has said, that the revelation of Christ was hidden from the ages in the past. No wisdom of the angel, no activity of the angels in the angelic age could ever bring forth an understanding of what you are about to do in Christ. In fact, when the gospel came forth, even angels peer into what was happening as you deal and deal with humankind and brought forth the revelation of Christ. So even from now until the end of all ages, Father, in the last end of time, we know there are many revelations flowing and we cannot understand them unless you so choose to reveal. So we will always be in the position of waiting on God waiting for you to reveal and once you reveal we receive your understanding and revelation we give you thanks father for you have been a faithful father you have provided bread and sustenance you have provided all things that we need in a season we give you glory and worship for unto you be all glory worship and honor unto the name of our lord jesus christ thank you father in jesus name and everyone say amen, amen. <clears throat> Now, in the book of Genesis chapter 22, we want to answer a question that is very pertinent to us. How can an event that occur sometime in the past or even now in the present continue to affect things in the future? So let's look at one major thing that, uh, that is greater than nations and greater than uh, anything that we know. And that is uh, uh, this place, this place that Abraham was told to go to in Genesis 22. Why was it important? Because here in Genesis, thousands of years before David, Abraham went to the place that was the future place of the temple that God wanted to build in Israel. And in a sense, it was also in the surrounding region where our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified at Golgotha. Why is all such energy concentrated on this place? And it's a physical place that in the time of Jesus, once he died, he released it upon the whole planet. And the place became a person. Because Jesus, as we all know, is greater than a place. You have to be greater than a place in order to change the place. So let's look at the beginning of this holy place in uh, Genesis 22. It was one. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he says, here I am. And the commandment was very uh, tough. It says, it was two. <coughs> Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. And uh, I've been um, encouraging different individuals to press into God to receive various downloads. Among them is our Abraham, uh, one of the three plus one, and uh, Leo, 
and uh, some others to continue to press in as they communicated with me. And one of the things that uh, Abraham, uh, our Abraham for Hong Kong, uh, wrote to me some of his recent downloads. And uh, it's an interesting part that one of his recent downloads said that uh, for Abraham, it was much harder and it was a greater faith to give his son, Isaac, than to receive his son. And that's so true. Even though it takes nearly 20 over years, from the age of 75 to the age of 100, before he received Isaac. And that was great faith. A great and steady faith that Romans chapter 4 talk about. Where against all hope, against every circumstantial thing, that natural thing that says it cannot be done, it's impossible for man, and he got it still. It was great faith. But greater still is the faith to give Isaac back than to receive Isaac. So take note of that. So now we have uh, God telling him, there is a particular place that God says that I want you to go and offer him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. So the whole general area of Mount Moriah, and of course, in every mountain, there's slight undulations, hills, and where they and to the exact hill and place that God wants him to offer Isaac. We all know that Abraham was now walking in what I call another higher level of holiness. Remember, I talk about uh, outer court holiness, and then the holy place holiness, and uh, the seven levels of holiness, and then there's a holy of holies, uh, and... Um, then there is the uh, representation of the uh, heavenly holy of holy place. And then there is a level of holiness which is becoming a personification. The word holy simply, simply means you belong to God. You're separated. The original word holiness, because for us humans we view holiness as uh, uh, in a different aspect. We don't realize that the original word holiness means uh, consecration and uh, ownership by God. Remember, we have two series of holiness and I, and I said holiness is simply ownership by God. Remember, the tie is holy because God says it belongs to Him. But in the physical, ten, physical, physical sense, if you can count physical money, uh, the $10 that belong to God and the $90 that that Lord, Lord lets you to keep, uh, there is no difference physically. The only difference is that one time belongs to God and that makes it holy. You could not identify the notes, whether the notes change. Our money is money. It's printed by governments. Um, it is because of ownership by God. And the more holy you become, the greater closeness you walk with God. God owns you more and more. And let me tell you, there is a place you walk into where God owns you 100% in every area. Now, some of you might say, oh, I'm 100% to God. Okay, let me test you up. In the first level of holiness, people only see outward things. They see holiness as what you don't do. Like you don't sin, you don't do this, you know. And that's what your body, that's a very outward thing. And God works with that level. When he worked in the Old Testament, he worked at that level. He tell them, okay, don't eat this, don't do that. Because that was a beginning of holiness. Where we have to understand that because you belong to God, you don't do certain things. Rooted from ownership with God. So God owns your body, God owns your soul, God owns your spirit. But here's the thing. There is a stage of holiness where God owns your every thought. You say, but I'm free to think. Yes. Are you free to do anything on earth? Yes. You can choose to do anything wrong if you want to, correct? God never removed the freedom. Why do we obey the Ten Commandments? Why do we obey the commandments of God? Because we are different. Because God doesn't like those things, correct? So we don't do those things God like. God doesn't like. We do the things God like because we belong to God. We are now children of God. So, in physical action, people only see holiness in terms of physical action. 
Then as you progress further, you realize that holiness is not just in actions, but holiness is a state of being. It's a your 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 state of being, ownership. You're owned by God. That's how you're holy. Now, how many of you wake up every morning and realize that not only does God own what your body do and your actions, not only does God own everything that you benefit on on this earth, not only does God own everything you own, your assets, your money and everything, but God owns your thoughts. God owns your words. That means if the Lord Jesus will not speak those words, then those words will not come from for, for your mouth. How many of us have given ownership of God to the words you speak, the words you write, the thoughts you think? See, but I'm free to think. Yeah, you're also free to act. I'm just pointing to you that there is a level of holiness where every thought you think has a permission from God. So you think that God owns you? I can tell you a lot of people claim to be owned by God, but it's only an outward sense. Like right now, if God were to ask you, sell all you have and give to the poor, <coughs> would you struggle? Would you do it? Some of you, like Peter, might say, Yeah, I will die for you. I will do it. Yeah. But if actually God gave the word, you might find it hard to do because the first thing you think about is how you're going to live. Then you forgot. God owns you. If God wants you to die in 24 hours without food, without water, then you just die. If God wants you to live for a thousand years, then you live because He owns you. So when you look at it, most people don't know the high le higher level of holiness. They think they do. And so here's Abraham. He enters into a level where God wants to take back what God gave him. Isaac. And to me, it is the toughest thing for Abraham to go through. Abraham was willing, according to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, he believed that God can give him back Isaac. His faith was so great. But how many of you, so you, I'm, I test you up by saying, you might be willing to give up everything in this life, sell all you have and give to the poor and follow Jesus, if Jesus really said that to you. How many of you, of course it won't happen, let me say again, God will not do that again because for Abraham, it was only one occasion to one human being and one time. It's a one-time deal. If Abraham did not do it, do you know God would find someone else? Because it was a prophetic act to show God the Father was going to give his only begotten son. And God should look for someone who has only one begotten son. If you have uh, 100 sons and God asks for one, it's different from you. Only one son, God asks for that one. It should be a perfect prophetic act. Do you know how hard it is to give your only begotten son? It is tough. Not just to give up, but to give as a burnt offering. So it's one of the toughest things that Abraham did. And um, let me get my one to make sure it doesn't turn around. Stop the thing. Okay. And so it says here, Abraham was most willing to follow God. And it was a level of holiness that none of us who have been asked to be a personification of anything will find it hard. There are a few people who touch on these areas. Joseph in the Bible touched on this area. These areas are when you become the personification of something in Christ. Like Joseph being betrayed, sold for 20 pieces of silver, and Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. That's tough. Any personification as a prophetic act is the toughest thing you ever do in your entire life because it goes against all the tenets of the human culture and race. 
And so here is Abraham. Because the God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham's life was to personify God the Father. And so in his way, God the Father revealing himself to the human race will at a future time gave his only begotten son. But God has to sort of in seed form prophesy. Do you know prophecies need not be spoken? Prophecy can be acted out. We saw Agabus is one of those kind of act, acting out type of prophecy. And Agabus signify. That means he acted out. Sometimes there are no words. Sometimes there are words. The acting out prophecy is the toughest. And there are a few people who have done it. Ezekiel. Isaiah, and as you know, a picture paints a thousand words. So it's more than a thousand words of prophecy when you do one prophetic act. Of course, some people run wild and everything is a prophetic act. They don't realize the prophetic acts are actually far and few in between. Not everything necessarily is a prophetic act, but there are some chosen ones that for lack of a better word, it touches the timeline cycle and impacts the future. It's like, imagine the river of the time of the human race flowing from one end to the other. Anything that is big enough that causes some changes in the river of time will affect everything in the future. Now, it takes a lot of humans and acts of God and works of angels to impact that normally. But once in a while, one act, one personification prophetic act of a human being under the instruction of a thus says the Lord, impacts the river of time permanently for the future. This is the act of Abraham. And I believe it's his toughest. Now, we jump ahead to the story. Where in the end, he was willing to do so. And even the words that he spoke were prophetic in verse 8. Once you move into a prophetic thing, God takes control of your actions and your words because of your willingness. The fact that Abraham was willing, an anointing came on him throughout the whole journey. So when Isaac asked, because at that time, he obviously has not been told yet. Otherwise, he wouldn't ask this question in verse 7. So the whole journey, Abraham had to keep it quiet. I believe that was the instruction of God. Until he has taken the wood, and put everything ready and build the altar. Then Isaac said, spoke to Abraham, My father, here am I, my son. Look, there is the fire, there is the wood, and of course there was the altar. Where is the lamb? And then only Abraham had to speak and tell him. And Abraham had to speak to him and Isaac has to make an immediate choice. There was a chance that Isaac might say, I'm not willing. And the whole thing would be cancelled. It took Isaac's obedience. So that's why Isaac also got some of the blessing. It involved him. Anyone involved in the prophetic act receive an eternal blessing. Do you know what? Do you know an e uh, a prophetic act out of personification lasts for eternity? Do you know when we all go back to heaven, and even in the millennium, and even in the new heaven and new earth, we will look to Genesis 22, that story. And it will play over and over again. Because that is the only time a human being can prophesy through an act, John 3.16, that God will send His only begotten Son. Now tell me, 
of all the beautiful prophecies of Isaiah and Psalms and all that, that indicate that the Son of Man will be Son of God and will sacrifice for us. Has anyone prophesied John 3.16 specifically? Even Isaiah 53, which talks about the suffering Messiah, <coughs> did not come close to showing that God's feeling. Remember how God's feeling is expressed in John 3.16? God so loved the world, so loved, not just love, that He gave His only begotten Son. There is no other prophecy of John 3.16 except for Genesis 22. And that story will last for eternities even in the new heaven, new earth. So the next time God tells you about a prophetic act through personification, you know that it is a permanent story that will be enshrined into the acts of the human race that is a prophetic act greater than even that written in ink and paper. So on that very occasion, Abraham said in verse 8, which is a prophetic word, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And so, that is a prophecy of Jesus, spoken to them. Then when they came to the place, they did everything, and by then Isaac knew, <laughs> knew about that. Isaac was willing, and then he literally had to go right until, he knew the knife was there. The knife was in his hand, and he was literally about to put the knife into Isaac. You can call it the last few seconds. How long does it take to put a knife in a person? Less than a minute. One minute, 60 seconds, few seconds. Go wait till the last second because it prophesied how even Jesus, the Lamb of God in Gethsemane, at the last minute say, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. If there's any other way, there's no other way. He must carry it to the last second. And then, as he was about to actually do it, can you imagine? He go, and normally you got to raise a knife up before you go down. So he literally, I mean, he was not doing slow motion. God, are you changing your mind? <coughs> God, no, no, you're sure about it. No, 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 no. He, he literally believed that God can raise him up. So he was very fast. He was going to do it in less than one minute. No slow motion here. He's literally going to do that. Because according to Hebrews 11, he knew God could bring Isaac back. So might as well kill him now and then God raise him up. So there's no delay, no slow motion, no checking, no confirmer, double confirmer, triple confirmer. No, 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 no. He just was, he already had made up his mind God can raise him from the dead. So he was just going to do it fast. I mean, think about this way. If you believe God's going to raise Isaac up, you try to do it, get it over as quickly as possible. So it's a very painful act to, to, to kill your own son. So my son, get it over quickly. I think he's in a hurry to get it done. Fast and quick. And because uh, it's a very hard part. My mother tells it. So at the last minute, he's about to put down the angel call out. Abraham, Abraham. Whoa. The knife was don't know how many inches from Isaac's chest. Because the prophetic act is done. Because the intent to kill him as a burnt offering, just as the same way he would kill the lamb if an animal was there. The intent must be released. And it was released. And then Abraham said, the knife dropped. And then he says, uh, he let go of the knife, or put it aside. Here I am. 
Then the angel says, Do not in worship lay hand on the lad. Do anything to him. For I know that you fear God, since you have not withhold your son. And here's a prophetic act. Your only son from me. Notice the word, second time, the word son is not mentioned in the, in the Hebrew. You only mention one time. You're not behold your son, comma. You're only from me. You know why you're only? It emphasizes you're begotten. You're only, only one from me. It's a prophetic act. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and there was a ram waiting for them. And that became, Abraham called the place, the Lord will provide. Which in Hebrew comes to Yahweh Yireh. Or the English sometimes translated wrongly, Jehovah Jireh. You know we got the word Jehovah from the early, what I call, enunciation of Hebrew. Because... Uh, then later on, they begin to get the more accurate pronunciation. That's how you get Yahweh. Yeah. So original was Je, Jehovah. But there's no J sound in the original. And uh, just like sometimes people call my name, you know, Johan instead of uh, Johan. The Johan is more the English enunciation, which I prefer the English one, by the way. So uh, because the other one, yeah, well, it sounds like a Y or something. And, uh, but the original was Yahweh, Yahweh. And so Abraham called the place the Lord provide in the mount of the Lord. Then the angel spoke a second time, and this is all blessing. By myself I saw on in verse 16, the angel speak on behalf of God, and that you have done this thing, have not withheld your son, and this time, your only, again emphasizing the only begotten son. See, it's a powerful prophetic act that points to John 3.16. Blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply your descendants. As the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is on the seashore, your descendants shall possess the gate of your enemies. In your seat, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you obey my voice. Again, I emphasize when they are emphasized that uh, when I thought about uh, last, Sunday. last Sunday, is it the hear, hearing the voice of God? The voice of God, obeying the voice of God. So the voice of God is different from the word of God, different from statutes, different from commandment. Because the voice is a living relationship you have and you hear his voice. So here Abraham obey God's voice. If you read through verse 10, 16 to verse 18, all the blessings are the same as given in Genesis 15 and Genesis 12. Only one part was different. Your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. So my question here, because Abraham is going to die and then he got many descendants after that. So Isaac was his only main covenant descendant. And then after Isaac, there were many other descendants. So we ask this question here. We ask this question here. What was released that was so powerful? What sort of energy? What sort of power that was released from that place that can draw a thousand years later? That energy released a thousand odd years later could bring about David to the same place could bring about the Temple of Solomon to be built in the same place. What sort of energy was released? It was the most powerful spiritual energy released that continued to affect the lives of thousands and millions of people, all released through one man. Two men, if you include Isaac, as obedient. But Isaac was more a recipient than the doer. It was all under Abraham's willingness. Now you know how powerful prophetic acts can be. How one small thing done 
under the voice of God become powerful. See, many people have no idea about all this background study of prophetic acts. I have actually done a whole biblical study of prophetic acts, which I have not taught in a series. Which is why sometimes when God talks about prophetic acts, to me, see, things affect you according to your understanding. Like, if I understand the prophetic acts and its impact on future generations, and perhaps even on the on the on the thousand years of the millennium, when God speaks of a prophetic act, it will affect me more because of my understanding. If people don't understand it, that they are is a small thing, then it won't affect you as much in obedience or disobedience. And um, so, prophetic acts are more powerful than we realize. Prophetic acts last longer than your lifetime. It goes beyond a lifetime. Which is why it's very important to obey prophetic act. And here's the other thing. I've studied prophetic acts. There are very few occasions when God called for a prophetic act. And of course, here's the other thing. Prophetic acts defy explanation, defy human culture, defy all other commandments. Because it defy the commandment not to kill here in Abraham's time. And of all things, it is almost puzzling to see that God wanted to kill the begotten son that he gave. In the first place, if Abraham never had a son, he was childless, so uh, no child between him and Sarah. And it was so hard to get the son. Now you want to take the son in a moment of time. So it defies human logic. The only thing about prophetic acts is you have to know the voice of God and what God speaks to you and understand the meaning of it which means that god could raise isaac from the dead and the whole thing is reversed into normal that means he can go back to normal even though god steps outside the boundary abraham believed god can restore isaac back and then when they go home it was like everything looks back to normal can you see that it's not a permanent damage it is something that God will restore everything to normal. So it's not abnormal. So when I say that it's contradictory to human culture and even logic, I'm not talking about damaging anything. Once it's done, everything goes back to normal. And to those who do not or are not partakers of the prophetic, they wouldn't even know a difference. How many people knew that Abraham did this? If Abraham didn't tell, nobody in the world would know. Maybe Sarah would in it. I know. But Isaac would know. Abraham would know. In fact, if Abraham and Isaac did not tell anyone, and they came back, and then if Sarah had asked, of course he did tell Sarah, and he did tell people, but if Sarah had asked, where did you go? Well, we just went there, we are back. That's it. <laughs> After Isaac was alive, Abraham was alive. So here's a part of prophetic, I study it. Prophetic acts return everything back to normal as if it has not occurred. That's a safety of prophetic act. So don't any Tom and Harry claim prophetic acts and hear you know, funny things from God. It has the power to restore everything back to normal after it's done. It is actually done in between God and the person or persons in secret because of an energy that I understand now. An energy that must be released that will affect generations to come. Very important. And it's done, led by the Spirit, by the same voice. How did Abraham know that it's a voice of God? Because this was the same voice that spoke to him before he left the land of Ur. This was the same voice that spoke to him to, uh, in Genesis 15, when he cut a covenant with God. This was the same voice that had guided him throughout his entire life. This is Isaac. According to some calculations, Isaac is most likely in his 30s. Now, Isaac was born when Abraham was 100 years old, correct? So, let's assume that he was 30 years old. He would be 130 years old. When did Abraham walk with God? 75 years old. That means at this point, 
Abraham would have walked with God if Isaac was 30 years old. He would have walked with God for 55 years. Now tell me, God will not, God will not give prophetic act to an amateur, to a novice. He will give a prophetic act to someone who has walked with him for decades because you're supposed to know God. So don't, don't just be a new Christian, no reason. Oh, God told me no, 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 prophet. God will have to train you first. He have to train you in many things so that God shows that His voice is real to you and that same voice that you trusted for 55 years tells you. And you know God so well. Abraham what we got for 55 years. I mean, I will include the 12 years of silence. I mean, when God started speaking, He knew God. It's a familiar voice when you walk with God for decades. The same, God never asked Ezekiel or uh, Isaiah to do prophetic acts until later in their ministry. When it was more difficult to prophesy by words than to prophesy by actions. It's the same thing. And the harder the prophetic act, the more controversial the prophetic act, the longer God waits before He brings it forth. It's important for us to note that. Now, what we're going to touch today is the impact of the energizing that can stay in control of the destinies of nations that rise and fall and of all the lives of people that follow, even without them knowing their energy has carried them. It's just like human beings, once a river is flowing at a certain level, Anyone who gets to it gets carried by the current. So how fast a river is flowing is based on the prophetic act that does. The prophetic act gives an energizing in a certain direction. So anyone who gets in without realizing it, realize that they're flowing in the flow of the prophetic act created by the ancestors. If the ancestors had what we got. So we talk about positive first and talk about spiritual ener energies. Thousands of years later, in First Chronicles, chapter three. Oh, yeah. First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, chapter three. Because it will be held under um, Solomon. So Solomon only chapter three, Second Chronicles. It says here, verse one. Now Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. But then he added something. Where the Lord had appeared to his father David at the place that David had prepared on the threshing floor of Onan the Jebusite. Wow! Two other people are involved here. Mount Moriah is definitely the same place that Abraham sacrificed Isaac. So here is the same Mount Moriah. At that time when Abraham went there, it was like a jungle. There were no cities, nothing was formed. But remember, everywhere the altars are built, humans begin to build cities and civilization. Now let's look first at David. When was David drawn to Mount Moriah? You might think at the time when he numbered the Israelites wrongly without sacrifice. No, it was before that. Do you know that the first act that Abraham did was to make Jerusalem the capital? In the book of First Chronicles, First Chronicles, and after all the um, names that were given. Oops, I have gone too fast to chapter 9. Okay, should start earlier on. I was punching 3, but punch at 9. Okay, after the names are given in the first few chapters, then they start talking about the life of David. Reuben is chapter 5. And, um, Family of Manasseh, family of Levi. Okay, just want to pass all these names to the story of David. 
let begin again. Ha. Huh. Okay, I know where I am. Second Chronicles. Uh, it should be. Actually, it should be Chronicles. Yeah, correct. No, no. Uh, correct. Because I'm seeing so many names. No, come on. Life of David. Whoa. All these names. Ah, finally. First Chronicles, chapter 11. Finally. Verse 1. Ten chapters of names. Now, verse 1. All Israel came together to David at Hebron, saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. And then by that time, David has already uh, ruled uh, to a certain extent. And uh, all the elders make a covenant to David in verse 3. David made a covenant with them. And they all anointed David king over all Israel. And verse 4, David and all Israel went to Jerusalem with Jebus because it belonged to the Jebusite. And the inhabitants of the land were there. Now, the first thing that David did when he became king over all Israel, some supernatural force was driving him to conquer the Jebusites. You know what? energy was flowing that affected their thoughts, their mind and their intention all the way from Genesis 22. Thousands of years, a thousand odd years ago, there was this energizing to go to this place of the Jebusites. In case you didn't realize it, God, you see that place would not have existed in David's time if David didn't conquer. Because God was interested in having them conquer the Jebusites. And um, uh, if you cross-reference on the Jebusites, you will notice that way back, way back, um, in, um, oops, let me get that out. Oh, way back, in the time of Moses, God tell them in chapter 13, Exodus 13, and um, verse 5. It shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Hevites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you. A land flowing with milk and honey that you shall keep this service in this month. So God mentioned the area of the Jebusites beside the Canaanites. And notice they were mentioned here among the last group that God wants them to conquer. And um, in mentioning them, again, let's uh, look over again. Chapter 20, verse 17 of Deuteronomy. Again, the Lord says, You shall, in verse 17, utterly destroy them, the Hittite, the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Perizzite, and the Hevite, and the Jebusite. Notice, they mentioned last. This is Deuteronomy 20, verse 17. Just as the Lord your God has commanded you. So God wants them destroyed. Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, when Joshua went into the land, uh, they did what they can, but according to the book of Judges, chapter 1, verse 21, it was in the area of the Benjamite. Now in the book of Judges, chapter 1, verse 21. But the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who inhabited Jerusalem. So the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day, to the day of writing of the book of Judges. After Joshua died, they still did not conquer 
the Jebusites. Remember the original plan that was supposed to conquer the Jebusites. They are mentioned among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, and everything. And finally, in King David's time, and uh, I took the First Chronicles story, but let's also go to the other story in Second Samuel chapter five. In Second Samuel chapter five. It was immediately again after the anointing of David to be king over all of Israel. He reigned about, uh, he reigned according to uh, chapter 2 Samuel chapter 5 verse 5. In Hebron he reigned 7 years and 6 months. In Jerusalem he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. Now do you notice that? They don't have Jerusalem yet. Yet in the history it says, oh, he reigned for seven years, six months in Hebron. He reigned for uh, the rest of the 33 years in Jerusalem. That tells you something. The first thing that he did when he became king over Israel was to get Jerusalem, to make it his capital. That was the first thing he ever did as a king over all the 12 tribes. When did David have that in mind? When did the Lord spoke to David to conquer Jerusalem? Whether it was a direct thought, direct word, there's no recorded prophecy that a prophet came to him and came to David and said, you must conquer Jerusalem and make it your capital. As you know, David depended a lot on the prophets. But yet this was something that was inside the DNA of David. When he looked around, perhaps as a military man, he realized that's a good place to build a capital city. That thought would have come from the Lord and his angels. That thought would have been energized from way back a thousand odd years before in Genesis 22 because of the energy that flow. See, the energy that flow will continue to create thoughts and energizing because God was bringing him nearer and nearer to Mount Moriah because the greatest achievement of David's life is not just conquering countries. It was building the temple or preparing the temple to be built. Because that was the place that God wanted to build the temple. And so, unknowingly, subconsciously, unaware of the thousand odd years before, David Went for by that time it was all the Jebusite's kingdom, and he conquered Jerusalem. The moment he conquered it, he made it the city of David, and he made it his capital to rule over all of Israel. Because for 33 years, that was the demarcation of his capital city. Hebron, seven years, six months. Jerusalem, 33 years. Think about it. It all came from the energizing of Genesis 22. Now, if, if God had told Abraham to go to another mountain, you know what would have happened? David would also go to the mountain. Talk about nurture versus nature. Here, you're talking about something greater than both nature and nurture. It was established before David was even born. Remember the promise of Genesis 22? Your descendants. Was Abraham, uh, was David a descendant of Abraham? Yes. Your descendants will conquer their enemies. And Jerusalem is based on David conquering the Jebusites. Literally fulfilling the promise to Isaac. Because from Isaac you have Jacob and Jacob you get the 12 tribes. They were descendants of Abraham. And they conquered their enemy. They conquered their enemy. And literally in David's time, all of the Canaanites, Jebusites, and everything in the land were conquered. So that, here's the thing, the only ones remaining are those who worship Yahweh. And the greatest conquest 
It's not killing them. It's when they worship Yahweh God. And Onan, if you remember, in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, Onan the Jebusite was a lover of David and a worshipper of Yahweh because he says, David, you can have my feel free to worship Yahweh God. So he was more or less like a converted Jebusite. He was a Jebusite. Onan was a Jebusite. And he was a converted Jebusite. And in Israel, there are two ways you can become an Israelite. Through being a proselyte or being a direct born. That is before the New Testament came. Where everyone who is born in Christ is a child of Abraham. Is a seed of Abraham. And is a true Jew as Paul mentioned. So here we have that impact of the energizing that drew David to Jerusalem. And when he conquered Jerusalem, he reigned for 33 years. It was only towards the end of his reign. There was one more thing that he must seal before his reign complete to establish the place to build the temple. So, you ask the question and I ask the question. I say, Lord, Moses in Deuteronomy told them that when they enter the promised land, that they will find, God will find them a place to build the temple. And um, it's covered in an entire chapter and it just under the title or subtitle, if your Bible has subtitle, the place kind of uh, uh, very interesting chapter that um, we can turn to. And uh, oops, let me get a direct way to go into that chapter here. Um, Pass all the other place. A prescribed place of worship in chapter 12. Chapter 12. The whole chapter 12 was titled A Prescribed Place of Worship. And God was very strict with them. God says, it was one. Let's read some of the background. These are the statutes and judgments which you shall be careful to observe in the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall dispose serve their gods, on the high mountains and on the hills, under every green tree. You shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the calf images of their gods and destroy their names from that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. But you shall seek the place where your Lord your God chooses out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place. And there you shall go, and there you shall burn your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, your heave offerings of your hand. Do you know where the first burnt offering was actually done? By Abraham, thousand odd years ago, because it was supposed to be a burnt offering. Yay, the same word, burnt offering. A thousand odd years before, Abraham already given the first burnt offering at the place. But it was secret. And now that Israel has become a full nation, God says, and this is Deuteronomy, before you go in, when you go in, there's only one place I want you to go, to have all your burnt offerings, sacrifices. Only one place. I will choose that one place out of all your tribes. And God never revealed the place. And the whole chapter is about the place. Look at verse 11. There will be the place where the Lord your God chooses. See, it's not their choice. Do you notice that? It is God's choice. You cannot say, I like this place, I like that place. No, no, no. God said, I choose. There are some things that God let us choose. There's something that God chooses. We got no choice. God says, I choose. And then look at verse 13. Warning. Take it to yourself that you do not offer your burnt offerings in every place that you see. But in the place which the Lord chooses, in one of your tribes. And then in verse 18, 
You must eat them before the Lord in the place. The whole chapter emphasizes that. And uh, verse 21. If the Lord, if the place where the Lord your choose, the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far from you, then you may slaughter, but then you must come and eat where God tells you to. And uh, Verse 26, only the holy things which you have and your vow offering you shall take and go to the place. And the Lord emphasized, which the Lord chooses, not you, the Lord chooses. The whole chapter is about the place, the place, the place, the place, the place the Lord chooses. Now here's the question. That is in Moses' time. The place was already designated from Genesis, but long forgotten. Because from Abraham to Moses is an odd plus and minus thousand odd years. And Moses, of course, when he spoke this, he was already 120 years. Then there was the reign of Joshua, the reign of the judges, the reign of Samuel, the reign of Saul, which lasted 40 years. And then only the reign of David, and at the end of David's life, he reigned seven years and six months, still no place. When he reigned 33 years, in the end of his 33 years, God showed the place. My question is, why these hundreds of years passed? When God spoke to them in Deuter Deuteronomy, it looks like as if when they go in, God was going to choose a place. Correct? If my understanding is correct, the way God spoke in Deuteronomy chapter 12 was when you go into the place, I will choose a place. And you would expect since he told the generation that in that generation God would choose a place. Correct. Then why so many hundreds of generations? The generation of the second generation under Moses, the generation under Joshua, the generation under the judges, the generation under Samuel, the generation under Saul. These generations never saw the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 12. You know what caused the delay? The people. Remember, the place was only revealed after all the Canaanites, the Hevites, the Jebusites were conquered. As long as the Jebusites were not conquered, even if you have a group there, God word cannot be revealed. I read to you those verses to show that the revelation of the place was tied to the conquest of all the Canaanites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. They were not conquered in Joshua's time. They were not conquered in the Judges' time. They were not conquered in Samuel's time. They will not conquer under Saul's time. One of the last remaining strongholds is the Jebusites because it's very hard to conquer. So now, it's a very tough terrain. I mean, even militarily, it's tough. He waited until they have the right king who know how to depend on God's military strategy, who learn how to depend on God, to conquer the last of the Jebusites. So you know what caused the delay? The people and not God. And at the beginning of his reign, when he, he was anointed to be king, finally when the anointing that made David king and he was king, the time came for the place. But God waited a few more decades because he reigned for 33 years until the end of his kingdom that God revealed one last thing. God will reveal one last thing. The place. Because it was time. The people delayed it. But there was also a fullness of time place was hidden from them. But I want to point to you this fact. 
the place of revelation was conditional upon all the Canaanites, Hivites, Jebusites being conquered. It was only completed under King David. And even after conquest, a few decades, everything sealed, settled, then the Lord revealed the place in the right time. Was it the permissive will of God or the perfect will? I would say God works His perfect will even when man was working His permissive will because of the energizing of Genesis 22. Say, so how can you say that? Because there was also another verse where God says, I will not let you enlarge your place too fast, but you will conquer when you enter the land of Canaan. God says, He will let them do so little by little, so that the wild beasts will not overwhelm them. And that verse is found in Exodus chapter 23, verse 28, 29, 30. I read to you. I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hevite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before you. I will not drive them out from you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased. So I don't think they could do it in one year. Maybe 40 years, maybe 80 years. So I believe that even in the perfect will, they could not have done it in one year. It might have taken them one or two generations. But one thing we know, one thing we know, and that is, they might have more generation than they should have. So even in a perfect timing, it would have taken maybe one or two generations. I mean, they must increase first, multiply. And we know that they were not walking in God's perfect will. The book of Judges is a sign of not, they're not in the perfect will. So there's much, much delay. Even King Saul was not the perfect choice. So there's much delay and King Saul reigned 40 years. So there, there were a lot, hundreds of years actually passed. Perhaps it was not as short as they should have been in the perfect will, but it was not as long as it should have been in their disobedience. But anyway, God was in control because the energizing from Genesis 22 was too powerful. It will still come to pass anyway. There's nothing that can stop it. Finally, it did come to pass under David's time. And the first thing he did, conquer the Jebusites. And several decades later, in his 33 years reign, he disobeyed God in numbering the Israelite. And notice, the whole thing is about numbering, numbering, because they have increased to a great multitude. They were greater than all, the population was greater than all the little nations around, or the nations that were inside them. Their numbers were greater than the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Jebusites. They have increased. The one thing David did not do in numbering is two things. He did not ask God first for permission. Number two, he did not give the assigned sacrifice when you number the people. So there were these two disobediences. And as a result, we have that story in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 24. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 24 where something good came out of something not so good. That showed the power of predestination. It says in 2 Samuel chapter 24, 
And the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. He moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. Actually, when you cross-reference the first Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1, it was not God, it was the devil. The Lord allowed the devil to test the people. They were the people have grown so great in number. And according to First Chronicles 21, verse 1, Satan came and tempted David the number. And while it's all about the number of the people, it was actually about the time for the people to find a place of worship. Everyone had forgotten Deuteronomy chapter 12. Everyone had forgotten Deuteronomy chapter 12. But not God. Everyone had forgotten Genesis 22, Mount Moriah, But not God. Everyone had forgotten that the conquest of the Canaanites and the Jebusites and the Hevites was crucial to discovering the place, but not God, because he has his eternal plan. So, out of an imperfect situation, when he out of pride numbered the Israelites, See, can good things come out of this? Yes. Remember that Moses at the age of 40, out of pride, slay the Egyptian. And he has to go to the wilderness, run away. So our imperfect situation, God still can bring something beautiful. And he was given three choices of judgment. And David says he will fall into the hands of God. 70,000 people died. And then when they were repenting before the Lord, it says, uh, as they were there restraining, David had a vision of the Lord. And remember, this is Jerusalem, his territory. This is where he built the city of David. So when he looks around and he was there, he saw the angel. God opened his eyes to see the angel. And just as the angel was about to strike, he says, Lord, have mercy. And when David was willing to give himself as a sacrifice, very close to Isaac willing to give himself a sacrifice, Abraham willing to give his sacrifice. Out of sacrifice, God brings beautiful things. Because you know what David's prayer was when he saw the angel about to kill the people? And he says, surely I've sinned, I've done wickedly. But what about this shit? What have they done? And then David was saying, kill me. Let it be upon me. And my, against my father's house. When he was willing to sacrifice his own dynasty and his own lineage, God's mercy came. Just like when Dan Daniel prayed. Daniel Daniel prayed, said, they are sin, they are sin, they are sin, even though he's righteous. He prayed, our sin. When he reached a level of sacrificial prayer, God did one powerful thing. On that day, God says, Build an altar here because here is where the plague stopped. At the very place where the plague stopped and he saw the angel, the vision of the angel, this is where I want you to build a temple. So we come back to Second Chronicles chapter 3 where we took off from. It says in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David at a place that David had prepared on the threshing floor of Onan the Jebusite. I know the other name is around Noah, but I know some people have more than one name and they're known by this and known by that. And he began to build on that second day of the second month in the fourth year of his reign at the very place when, where, where Abraham sacrificed his son, where David sacrificed himself, where David had a vision, and in the city where they conquered the Jebusite. And of all things, that place is owned by a converted Jebusite who offered himself to Yahweh God. What a powerful energizing. And here's the thing. 
all these things were controlled by a powerful energy release from the time of Genesis 22. What kind of power is so great? There are many things in this walk of the end time when God tells you to do certain things. And you must be willing to allow God to energize to you. Whether it be an instruction of God to get up at 4 every morning and pray, or to spend a certain time with God every day, or, you know, that will be releasing the other type of energizing. Energizing can be released in various forms. One, through a personification prophetic act. Through a daily ritual that God asks you to do, or you came to show your love to God in a certain way. I call that the Cornelius effect. When Cornelius continually pray at a certain time, it creates what I call the Cornelius effect. You know what the effect is? The angel told Cornelius in the book of Acts chapter 10, your prayers have become a memorial before God. In the spiritual world, it has such an impact and it brought forth a revival. So my question here is to you is this, what have you done to create the energizing in your life? And I believe that that one year of fasting and prayer of the word fast in my life was what changed my whole character or my future till my last breath on this physical earth. Everyone must create an energizing for your future to prayers to fasting you don't fast and pray only when you are in need you do not fast and pray only when you're in trouble cornelius effect can also be called the daniel effect you know how long daniel prayed three times a day from a young man till he was an old man he prayed three times a day. Whether he was busy, not busy, whether there was a test or trial or no test and trial. He was a man who created energizing for his future. What are you creating for your future? What river of energizing have you released into the spiritual realm? Your future is made up from the energies released from your past and your present. And the decisions you make. The, you reap what you sow. And it ties back to this principle of sowing and reaping in the book of Galatians, chapter 6. Galatians, chapter 6, where it says in verse 7 Do not be deceived. God is not mock. Whatever a man sows, he will also reap. And it says it will affect both positive and negative. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. He who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. We talk about increasing the life in our life. What are you sowing for the future? I trust that all of you are good stewards of your money, of your material things. You know how to save budget, live according to budget. So you have learned how to sow and reap in the natural. Let me ask you, how are you sowing and reaping with your precious time? How are you sowing and reaping on spiritual things? What have you invested spiritually? For we will reap what we sow. And I will just tell a short story from the Bible of the negative side. Whether it's positive or negative, everyone reap what they sow. No one escapes. Let me tell you, people think they can get away with different things. You cannot. 
you will reap what you sow. And um, in the book of Judges, there's a very interesting story of not just Gideon. It is about Gideon's 70 sons and what happened to them. And tells us here in uh, chapter 8 of the book of Judges. In chapter 8, after Gideon died, um, it says in verse 34 and 35, humans are humans, they don't remember your kindness. It says in verse 34 35, Thus the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who has delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. Nor did they show kindness to the house of Jerubabel, that is Gideon, in accordance with the good he had done for Israel. Gideon had sacrificed his life to become one of the judge. But after Gideon died, one of the sons of Jerubabel of Gideon rose up and he said all the wrong things. He says, please speak in the hearing of all the men of Shechem. Which is better for you? That all 70 of the sons of Jerubbaal reign over you, or that one reign over you? Remember, I'm your own flesh and bone. And one of the sons, a bad guy called Abimelech, rose up and he showed how bad he is in verse 4. He hired worthless and reckless men to follow him. So he's a bad guy. In verse 5. They went to his father's house at Opar and killed his brothers. When a person can rise up to kill his own brother, the 70 sons of Jeru Jerubbaal on one stone, only Jotam, the younger son, escaped. So out of 70 sons, one was a rebel, one young one escaped. And when he escaped, he ran up to the Mount of Gerizim and he said, he tell this parable. He said, listen, you men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. The trees went out to anoint a king over them. They said to the olive tree, reign over us. The olive tree said, should I cease giving my oil with which they honor God and man and go to sway over other trees? Then the tree said to the fig tree, come, reign over us. The fig tree said, Shall I seize my sweetness and my good fruit and go to sway over trees? In other words, he got nothing better to do. I already got things to do, as, a, as he said, the good tree. Verse 12. The tree said to the vine, You come and reign over us. The vine said, Shall I seize my new wine, which cheers both God and man, and go and sway over trees? Then the tree said to the bramble bush, and he made a beam like a bramble bush, a rotten guy. Come and reign over us. Then the bramble bush says, In truth, you anoint me as king over you. Come and take shelter under me. So it really, the parable was really mockery. A bramble bush is a tiny little fellow. And all the trees are to go and bow under the bramble bush. And, uh, and then it says, uh, But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Then it says, Say Jotam to Abimelech on all the wrong fellows. If you acted in truth and sincerity, in making Abimelech king, if you have dealt well with Jerubbaal, that's Gideon, and his house, and had done things as he deserves, my father fought for you, risked his life, delivered you out of the hand of Midian. You have risen up against my father's house this day, killed his seventy sons on one stone, make Abimelech the son of his female servant king over you. If you are acting in truth and sincerity, then rejoice. But verse 20, if not, let fire come from Abimelech, devour the men of Shechem and Beth Milo. Let fire come from the men of Shechem and from Beth Milo, devour Abimelech. Then Jotam ran away. After he spoke the parable, he ran. Verse 22, three years later, Abimelech reaped what he sowed. You cannot build your kingdom on killing people. 
You cannot build your ministry on destroying other people. You cannot build a church on backbiting and gossip. You cannot build your spiritual life on based on who you go against. You have to build your life on your own relationship with God, the positive things. People who build on negative things will reap what they sow. No one escapes. Every word you say wrongly, every word you wrote wrongly, every act you did wrongly will come upon your head and will destroy yourself. God is not mocked, says Galatians. Every man or woman or child will reap what they sow. If you sow in the Spirit in love and truth, you will reap that. If you sow in a flesh and in destruction, you yourself will not escape. In the end, God is just. Which is why I always advise people, in every situation, only act in love. Only keep sowing love. Because love and truth are the only two seeds we must keep sowing. And we watch everything else. Because if you want to build your future, you must build upon what you sow right now. Sometimes it's tempting to jump on the bandwagon of stone throwing. Just like news and all these things happen. Don't join the bandwagon. Keep sowing good seeds. For everyone will reap what they sow. God is not mocked. Now, some people claim to be good people, but let me tell you, good people do not use bad methods to do good things. You can tell good and bad by two things. By the nature and character of Christ and by the methods they use. So it's important to release the positive energy and God's energy that will affect your future and to guard against negative energy. Now, some of you might say, what happened? I've really done the wrong thing. Easy. Repent. Ask God to forgive you and cease from all the wrong sowing. Because 24 hours a day, whether you like it or not, you're sowing in words, thoughts and deeds. And it will pile up and like Matthew 12 says, to be something that is your own retribution. It is important that as we enter into all night prayer, as we enter to spend time with God, that we are now going to sow like Daniel so regularly in prayers. Like uh, Gideon, uh, uh, Gideon or like uh, um, Cornelius. So in prayer. And like Abraham, he always saw good things. And are you a man, woman, who saw good things or who saw bad things? Remember, God watches when nobody is watching. What we do in public or in private, your intention and your actions are measured on a scale. The same thing, the same measurement is measured back. Do you know in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, when he said, Give and it shall be given to you, good measure, press on running over, shall men give to your bosom? Do you know the context is about judging people? We use that for offering. Well, have a look. It's about sowing and reaping and actions, and not just about money. Luke 6, 38. Which is why I always tell people this. If something bad happens or something terrible happens uh, to any people, if it's not something that is good, you know, where it's necessary, I will teach it and discuss it, what lessons we can learn, and that's it. But no point continuing to gossip about it. And if it's something really not true, if something true and things bad have happened, 
I wouldn't continue the gossip. I just deal with it and that's it. If it's something really not true and you continue talking about that, you are sowing the wrong seeds. And of course, if it's something true and worthy, whatever things are good, whatever things are true, whatever things have virtue, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, 8, 9, 10, think on these things, Paul said. But here in Luke 6, 38, we all know, Give, it shall be given to you, good measure, pressed on, shaken, together, running over, will be put in your bosom. With the same measure that you use, it will be measured to you. Right? Everyone use it for finances. Look at the verse before. One verse before. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Let me put it this way. You will judge people harshly. The same measurement is going to come back to you. You cannot run. It's going to come back. Just like it came back on Abimelech Shechem. And if you condemn people harshly, it will come back to you. If you don't forgive, the spirit of unforgiveness will still come back to you. God is not mocked. Whatever a person sows, they shall reap. My exhortation, sow good seeds. Create good energies for your future. For your, from your present to your future. So it's important for us as we give ourselves to all night prayer to build a memorial before God. A memorial that will energize you 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years all the way to the rapture. Because you will need the energizing that you can. And if there are prophetic acts that you need to do that under instruction of the voice of God, flow with them. If the things that are decisions you need to make that will be an energizing seed, do them. Be led by the Spirit. And it's important for us to understand this principle of spiritual energies that flow. In the end, God is just. God is true. Every person reads what they sow. And the story is not ended until this planet Earth is finished and completed in a seven times seven year cycle. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you teach us the power of spiritual energies that flow. Power of predestination. We stand on the head and shoulders, on the shoulders of those who are before us. We tap upon the goodness of their lives, the doctrines they have brought forth, the revelation they've given. But we are those that future generations depend on. Because future generations will look back at us and see what kind of ministry, personality, character, and churches we build. And we ourselves will become that which we will do and see. For when a person continues on and on in the wrong direction, they will change their own character and read what they saw. When they continue on the good path, then it will produce good. We know goodness and mercy follow us as we love Jesus and follow Him all the days of our life. Let it be only goodness for your people, Lord, as they move into the glorious church. The glorious church is glorious because we sow right now. Mm -hmm. What we reap in 10 years' time, in 5 years' time, in 15 years' time, in 20 years' yes, time, yes, yes. depends on what we sow right now. Although many people cannot see the seeds that are being sown, the way we react in trials and tribulations, the way we do things, the way we carry ourselves correctly in season and out of season, but yet we're going to reap a harvest. Yes, and there's an energy that has released that will go forth. And the harvest is coming forth. Because you have said, in the fifth to sixth year of this move, we begin to eat of the fruit of the trees. Five years we have flown into this end time move. And you say when you plant a tree, we can begin to take of his fruit. 
in the fifth and sixth year. Thank you, Father, that this year indeed, we will begin to see the fruit of all that we have sown and many more seven times seven years. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Let's all rise together and just sing a simple song. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And the most important place to be is what I call thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is important sowing. How do we know we're in the right mood and right group and right people? Are you with a group of people who are filled with gratitude? Remember, we talked about one Japanese guy, Imoto, who discovered water molecules that flow. And he found that the most powerful forces on the water molecules is gratitude, thanksgiving. And the New Testament is filled with verses of thanksgiving. It says when you pray and offer your prayers, when you fight a fight of faith, thanksgiving must accompany that. Philippians chapter 4 tells us that do not be anxious, but with your prayers in thanksgiving, bring it before God. So we thank you, Father God, that as we approach with gratefulness, be thankful. You know the, the people who went against Gideon's sons and killed them on one stone? They were ungrateful people. They were people who forgot the good things and uh, that God has done in their lives through Gideon. So, as we come to a close in prayer before God, let's remember the spirit of thanksgiving. It says in Philippians 4 verse 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer with supplication and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And even when you grow in Him, Colossians 2 verse 7 says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Enter His gate with thanksgiving into his cause with praise. Even David understood that. Now you know why David was a great man. Was David a vengeful man? Think about the many things done to David. He faced ungrateful people in the wilderness. He faced King Saul. He has only done good things for Saul, but Saul saw him as evil. And even when Saul was going out to actually kill him, he protected Saul. He restrained his hand. Because it was David who sang, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. David was a grateful man. When King Saul died, did he dance over his grave? No, most people would dance over the grave. Bad people would, average people would, but David was above average. He gave thanks and he thanked God for whatever life that Saul gave him or Jonathan, his friend that's been with him. Thanksgiving. We must live in thanksgiving. We are filled with a world of ungrateful people. Romans chapter 1 says, you know the key thing about the planet Earth, why God rejected humans? Ungrateful. If the ungratefulness of the world creep into you, you will become ungrateful. Don't let the world spirit affect you. Even if a person has done 99 things wrong and one thing right, I will still focus on the one right thing. Because we are ungrateful people. Spirit of thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord. That is the sign of true Christianity. And a sign between the tares and the wheat. The wheat give thanks. The tares never give thanks. God bless you and have a good prayer.
this evening. Amen.